Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Winston Churchill said, you've got enemies? Good. That must mean that you stood up for something sometime in your life. The winner of the Lifetime Achievement in Climate Science Award, Dr. Tim Ball, has certainly stood up for many things in his life. And he's done this under some of the most challenging conditions you can imagine. He's done it in front of lawyers in terrible court cases. He's done it in front of aggressive and ignorant politicians in government hearings. He's done it radio and TV. He's done it in thousands of presentations all over the world. When I think of Dr. Ball, I think of one word in particular, and that is courage. He's one of the bravest people I have ever known. Yet Dr. Ball retains his sense of humor. Earlier this week, he laughed to tell me a story about when he spoke to a grade four class. The teacher announced that he was a climatologist. And one of the students quickly put up his hand and said, how many mountains have you climbed anyway? <laughs> well, Dr. Ball may not be a professional mountain climber, but he has certainly overcome huge obstacles to get out the word on climate change reality and get out the word he does indeed. A Google search of Tim Ball and climate change yields over 66,000 results. And if you search for his name and the word denier, you come up with over 18,000 results. Of course, Tim is the exact opposite of, the, of a denier. He says that climate change is all the time. But activists do their absolute best to smear him in every way possible. And they have really good reason to fear him because he not only does good science, but he sways public opinion. And he does this because he cuts right to the chase and expl explains science in a way that any intelligent layperson can understand. During the day after one of Tim's pieces was published on the Drudge Report, he received 1,000 emails approximately from the public, 90% of which were supportive. And believe it or not, he answered over 500 of these emails personally. The amount of work he does is quite incredible. One thing that really stands out in my mind was his contribution to the Climate Change Reconsidered reports. You see, one thing Tim does, and I think you'll see it in this video, is he puts the pieces together in a way so that we can understand who did it, what they did, and why they did it. And in particular, I alert you to his book, Human Caused Global Warming, the Biggest Deception in History, the Why, What, Where, When, and How It Was Achieved. So that's a book that I certainly encourage people to look at. Tim grew up near Stonehenge in England. And indeed, Stonehenge influenced his worldview right from the start about the relationship between humans and nature. When asked about his religion, Dr. Ball says, Druid. Tim's awareness of the world was enhanced by his years working and on flying anti-submarine over the Atlantic, and also in his time at search and rescue uh, in Western Canada. It was during this period that he became aware of how bad weather forecasting really was and how little data actually existed across the world, how few weather stations there really were. Tim actually went back to university to study why the weather forecasting was so bad. This led him to meet and learn from people like Hubert Lamb that there was simply not enough data. It led Tim to produce a long-term record to accommodate some of the short and medium-term cycles. You see, Tim Ball is a fan of Sherlock Holmes, who warned this. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. And of course, that's exactly what's happening in the climate debate. Tim Ball completed a climatology doctorate from the University of London. He then worked as a climatology professor at the University of Winnipeg, where he won many outstanding teaching awards. And this is one of his greatest contributions. He was very valuable to the many groups he worked with, and it's because of his extraordinary teaching skills. I often thought that Ball was the right last name for Tim. Because think of it, the harder you throw a ball against a wall, the harder it comes back. <laughs> Tim obviously followed another Churchill idiom, and that's this. 
If you have an important point to make, don't try to be subtle or clever. Use a pile driver. Hit the point once, then come back and hit it again. Then hit it a third time, a tremendous whack. Dr. Ball has certainly given the climate scare a tremendous whack. For that, as well as his friendship, as well as his superb skills and patience in explaining climate science, I express my gratitude. While he can't be here in person, I have the honor of introducing a video from Tim Ball, the award winner for tonight. So I introduce you to Tim Ball. Well, I want to start by thanking the Heartland uh, Institute for this award. Um, and uh, it uh, is gratifying after all these years of fighting and struggling about climate and getting the truth out to the public. And that's always been the struggle because um, although they say it's about climate, it really isn't about climate. It's about overpopulation. The whole issue uh, was that they used climate uh, as a vehicle for their argument that the world is overpopulated. And of course they use the climate because it's global and it's the in the classic tradition of what people fear and that is the sky is falling. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Lowell Ponte who wrote a book called The Cooling uh, because one of the things that's happening is that um, when I started out, global cooling was a threat, and then of course as, as uh, time went on, global warming became the threat. And this is what uh, Ponte wrote back in 1972. He said, it is cold fact that global cooling presents humankind with the most important social, political, and adaptive challenge we've had to deal with for 10,000 years. Your stake in the decisions we make concerning it is of ultimate importance. The survival of ourselves, our children, our species, Species. And um, of course, the, the thing with that is if you just change the seventh word, which is cooling, to warming, then precisely the same threats about the end of the planet and the end of the world uh, are being made now about warming. And um, the um, one of the one of the things that I will try to educate people about is there are, are signals that should warn you that, that this is propaganda. And in this particular quote, the minute the minute the people start threatening your children or your species, then then you know all they're trying to do is is um, use your fear of the sky is falling uh, situation. And of course, that's what's been going on. Um, global warming was chosen um, by the uh, people that were working for the Club of Rome because, of course, it's the original chicken little, the sky is falling threat that everybody has. The Club of Rome uh, really, and, and, and this is important for people to understand, global warming was never about climate change. It was always about overpopulation. And this is one of the things that you see once you start to show people, well, look, here's why it's not about CO2 or global warming. They always fall back on, oh, well, the world's overpopulated. That's the, that's the default threat to the world. The truth is the world's not overpopulated by any stretch of the imagination. When you look at a country the size of Canada, the second largest country in the world, with a population the same as California. So it, it just just rubbish. You might say we don't want more people, but that's a different issue. And and of course that's what I always call it the immigrant mentality. And I, I'm in close the door. It's a very standard approach to things of how our emotions dictate how we feel about things. So the global warming issue then uh, emerged from the threat of overpopulation. The Club of Rome formed in 1968 by David Rockefeller uh, decided that uh, the, the uh, world was uh, each person in the world was using so many resources. Even if you were in a developed nation, undeveloped nation, I should say, you're going to take certain resources out of the world to uh, to exist, out of nature to exist. And so, if you take that by the seven billion population, they argue that um, 
that seven billion, then even just at basic use, are using resources that are more than the than are available in the world. So you started to see things, uh, ideas like limits to growth, and of course uh, overpopulation became a main theme. And this really uh, uh, culminated in Paul Ehrlich's book in 1972 uh, called "The Population Bomb," um, and where they argued that, as I said, that there are too many people in the world. Um, the the idea was then that there are too many people, they're using too many resources, even just well, everybody's using resources at a base level. But the bigger problem was the industrialized nations were using resources at far greater rate than the un, uh, undeveloped nations, the, the non-industrialized nations. So they decided to set up a plan by which they could um, get rid of the industrialized nations, which of course meant reducing the, the level of CO2 that they were producing, and, and, and by, that, by that form reduce, reduce the world population. Um, and so Morris Strong, the Canadian, sad to relate, to, but um, actually a, a, a very, very clever person, and that's one of the things that we've got to keep in mind, is just because people do evil things, doesn't mean they're not very clever. In fact, it takes an extremely clever person to use the system and misuse and mislead the system. And and Mar Strong was charged by the Club of Rome with dealing with this problem of uh, using up too many resources and reducing that use. And in a book called uh, The Cloak of Green with Elaine Dewar, it is a very fascinating book because Elaine Dewar wanted to write a book praising Canadian environmentalists, people like Suzuki, Elizabeth May, and so on. And she started researching her book. She was an investigative journalist with the Hamilton Spectator. The more she talked with these people and interviewed these people, the more she discovered that they were more political and more manipulative than the people they were attacking. And so, uh, and this, this is a marvelous piece of, of good journalism, which doesn't occur anymore, because she started with one hypothesis, and then her research showed her that that hypothesis was wrong. But instead of saying, "Well, no, I won't, I won't pursue it anymore," she said, "No, I'll look at the null hypothesis." In other words, well, why is this? Why are these people as, as corrupt? And so she wrote the book. When she was talking with Maurice Strong, she said to him, "What's the problem for the planet?" And he said, "The problem for the planet are the industrialized nations." And he said, "Isn't that our response?" Ability to get rid of them. Well, think about that. One of the evil geniuses of people like Murray Strong is they can take an idea and put it into practice. Now think about all the ideas, millions of ideas every single day, but how many of them ever actually get implemented or put into practice? And so to take an idea like the world's uh, the, uh, the industrialization, uh, we've got to get rid of those industrialized nations, how would you even think about going about that? That's what's amazing about these people. And, and so what he decided was that um, he set up, uh, he went to the, he said, and, and in talking with uh, uh, Elaine Dewar, she said, well, are you going to run for politics? And he, and he said very wisely, unfortunately, he said very wisely, you can't do anything as a politician. And she said, well, then what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go to the United Nations where I can get all the money I want, do anything I want, not be accountable to anybody. And that's exactly what he did. He went after running uh, Petro Canada here and being head of Ontario Hydro. He took off in, in 1992 and became uh, set up the United Nations Environment Program. This is incredible. That it's what some of these people are able to do. And so from 1992 on, he set up the United Nations Environment Program, which was really directed at eliminating the industrialized nations of the world. And uh, what what he wanted to show was that the, you, if, if you want to shut down an industrialized nation, he said it's running on fossil fuels, so you can shut off the pipeline. The, 
that's feeding those nations, but the people would scream immediately. And you've only got to watch, you know, gas prices go up and immediately there's an outcry. But he, he determined that if you could show that the byproduct of those industrialized nations, which was CO2, was causing the global temperature to rise and you're going to have runaway global warming, that would then allow you to say, hey, I'm saving the planet. These people are destroying the planet. And that's why CO2 became the focus of everything. And yet, look at CO2. Yes, it's a greenhouse gas, and by that it means that it's a gas that allows sunlight to come through, that heats the Earth, the Earth then gives off radiation at a different wavelength that can't pass through the, the CO2. That's the greenhouse effect, okay? And the three greenhouse gases are methane, CO2, and water vapor. But here's the amazing thing. CO2 is only 4% of the total uh, greenhouse gases. Water vapor is 95%. And most people know that. Farmers know. In the fall or in the spring, I mean, right, right now, if you get cloud cover, you get more high level of humidity, the temperature is not going to drop below freezing overnight because the water vapor is keeping that heat in. And, and you can look at it any day, just a different level in water vapor affects the temperature. But all of the focus is on CO2. And that, again, is what's amazing, is that if you're going to fool people, what the magician does is waving his hand over here, getting your attention over here, meanwhile, they're picking your pocket over here. And that's exactly what they did with, with, with getting the focus on CO2 and ignoring the, the water vapor, which is the, the really um, the most important factor of greenhouse gases. And so, so uh, Murray Strong set this up through the uh, United Nations. It became part of Agenda 21, which was really <clears throat> an attempt at global governance. That is to, to have, because a, a, what they were saying was, no one nation can control or, or uh, deal with global warming. It needs a world government to do it. So it's basically uh, a, a way of getting world socialism. And of course, Maurice Strong, even though he was a capitalist and made a whole lot of money as a capitalist, he, he really was at heart and philosoph philosophy a socialist. And you see that in today's world, this bizarre situation where you've got people like George Soros, who's a multi-billionaire, and yet he's funding all of the socialist uh, governments and, and agencies around the world. And, and so there's this absolute contradiction in that, well, how can you be a capitalist and yet promoting socialism? And, and I haven't really figured out, out yet why that happens. I think it, it's possibly out of guilt of making money or that you feel you're exploiting people. I mean, so many of them try to give their money away. I mean, there was one the other day that was talking about giving $2 billion to charities and so on. But but that's that's the interesting part about it. But Maurice Strong, as I said, he, he went, um, set up the United Nations program, and of course the whole focus was on CO2. Now, how, did, how were they able to scientifically get the focus on CO2? One of the things that I learned years ago was I used to think commissions of inquiry were great ideas. You know, you've got people fighting over an issue, the politicians don't understand it, they can't get their hands on it, they're getting different things from different experts. And finally they throw their hands up and say, we'll have a commission of inquiry, and everybody goes, oh, good. And that's how I used to feel until I got appointed to my first commission of inquiry. And that was a... a conflict over a lake in Manitoba where people were arguing about irrigation water and pollution of the lake and who had the rights to the water and so on and so forth. And and by the way, in, in a Canadian context, we talk about Aboriginal land claims. We haven't even got around to discussing Aboriginal water claims. That's going to be a whole different uh, issue in, in Canada. But and anyway, this minister finally said, okay, we'll, we'll have a commission of inquiry. And everybody said, great. And then he called me up and said, would you be on the commission? And I said, sure, quite happy to be on the commission. And within a week, uh, we had a chairman, and then we got the terms of reference for the commission. The terms of reference, which were written by the minister, so in other words, he had far greater control than he had before, in conjunction with the bureaucrats. And the terms of reference were so limiting that it, the only solution we could give 
from those terms of reference was what he, the answer that he wanted. In other words, he predetermined the outcome of the Commission of Inquiry. And um, when I talk to people about this, you think about the one of the biggest commissions of inquiry of, about um, uh, conspiracy theories. And, and Judge Warren, who was put in charge of the Kennedy inquiry, and that's still one of the biggest on the internet, you know, the, the, the uh, conspiracy of that. And they were, they were interviewing Judge Warren, who was the chairman of the commission, and they said to him, why didn't you look at uh, the mafia connection in Dallas, and Jack Ruby, and all of that side? And he very calmly said, it wasn't in my terms of reference. Well, of course, I, having gone through this, knew exactly what he was saying. But for most people, it just went right over their heads. So in other words, his terms of reference said, don't go where you're probably likely to find the right answer of what's actually going on. And this is how uh, governments, uh, by appearing to give away uh, control, are actually retaining more control. And and so, uh, as I said, when I, when I was appointed in my first commission of inquiry, um, I learned what was going on. I served on many commissions of inquiry after that, but in every single case, I said I will only serve on the commission if I get every single bit of information that I want, that I uh, w require, and, and I will warn you right now that I will, if you don't give me that, I'll go to the media and say they're denying me access to information because they want to predetermine the outcome. And of course, no politician wants that kind of thing on their hands. But but this is how they how things are controlled and, and, and how it goes. So so Maurice Strong, when he set up the United Nations program on environment and climate, his definition of, of the, the the commission that was in, was set up to look at it was the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. People think that they're looking at climate change in total. They're not. Murray Strong, the definition he gave them to them was only look at human causes of climate change. Now, you can't possibly do that because you can't separate human causes of climate change if you don't understand and know natural causes of climate change. But the world thinks that these people are looking at climate change in total, and they're not. And so, of course, they narrow the focus. And so when they look at the greenhouse gases, for example, all they look at is CO2, because that's the only one the humans produce. So this is how the whole thing was controlled, to narrow the focus on CO2, and then to say, look, the CO2 is coming mostly from industry and industrial activity, and therefore we're going to shut industry down uh, based upon that. And I should tell you that in 2015, January 2015, they were on the verge, they being the United Nations, were on the verge of, of introducing legislation to limit the amount of CO2 that 13,000 industries worldwide could produce. That would have shut down and controlled the whole thing. And, and uh, fortunately, uh, people started to realize, some politicians started to realize what damage this would do, particularly the American politicians. And so there was a reaction to it. But in the meantime, of course, uh, they've been successful in, in putting CO2 at the very center of everybody's focus and, and concern. And, and that's where we are today. And I wish to thank you for listening to my uh, views on uh, the whole uh, obsession with CO2, how and why it became the focus, and why we need to uh, fight back and, and, and look at what we're really doing and, and getting our priorities right. And thank you for your time and thank you for this opportunity.